Hi, welcome to a new video. Today we want to look at the displacement gradient. I want to give an introduction and then we will calculate two simple examples. For the displacement gradient, let us look again at the general setup in continuum mechanics. So we have a coordinate system describing two configurations, a reference configuration and a spatial configuration. So we have two potatoes and we transform the one first potato into the second potato. And the change in configuration is called our motion. And if we look at particular particles, continuum particles in our configurations, so for example, we track the atoms, then we see that they are displaced and the displacement of their position is a U vector. And the U vector or the displacement vector contains all the information on the change of, um, of our potato. Let's call this all the information of potato change. And by this I mean it associ associates each point within the reference configuration with a point in the spatial configuration. So um, to say u is some sort of a function which maps the x points the capital X points to the lowercase x points. And this is extremely general. It contains many different things, or more precisely, it contains three things. So we have translation. Okay, this makes sense. If our vector u applies like homogeneously to all points within our reference configuration, then we just move our potato. We can also have a rotation, which would be that um, our points uh, that are close to the rotational axis are not get moved that much, but points further away get moved a little more. Or we can lastly have shape change. And this is probably the most interesting in the sense of continuum mechanics, since what is also visible here that the shape of the potato has changed. So that so there are particles in our reference configurations that are getting moved further or differently than others. And this kind of inhomogeneous movement pattern or displacement pattern kind of results in a change of the shape, most certainly. And the problem here is that all this information is contained in the displacement vector, but it's not that easy that we can extract this information, especially since there are multiple modes of shape change. There could, for instance, be some sort of a shear, or there could be an elongation, or we could have a compression. All these kind of things, and they are hidden in this u vector on this function u. And in order to extract it, we have to access it more deeply. And that is where our displacement gradient comes in. And the displacement gradient is called capital H and it will be a rank two tensor. So a matrix, therefore a double underscore. And as the name already suggests, it's a gradient. So we have to take the gradient of something. And since we want to take analyze the displacement, we are taking the gradient of the displacement. But then we have to again ourselves self ask with which or with respect to what do you want to take the gradient? And most notably here, it makes the most sense to take the gradient with respect to the reference configuration. So we choose gradient and with the capital G means with respect to reference configuration. And we take the gradient of our displacement function, which depends on the position in the reference coordinate system and the time t. And mathematically speaking, that would be the derivative of our vector function u, so which associating a translation or like a displacement to each point. Um, and we derive this with respect to capital X. Okay, let us look at an example. And for this, let us look at the examples I've used a couple of times now, where we have a square, which is of shape one and one, and it is elongated 
alongside the first, the E1 axis, and it then turns two in length. And what is the displacement or what is the displacement function of this problem? Well, most certainly there are more than one displacements, um, but the most simple displacement is a linear displacement. So we kind of stretch our material and so a point that is here gets moved here and a point that's here is getting moved here. And this can be seen as follows. So we have a u, which is a function of x and t in general. And here it is only a function of x. And this displacement is derived as follows. Since our particle is not moving in the e2 axis, so there is no change in displacement. And it moves to the right by the same amount as it, or by the, by the value as it has in the first coordinate axis. Since it is 0 0.5 here, the distance it's traveling is also 0 0.5. So the first component is x1. Consequentially also for the, for the second point, which is, let's say, close to 1. So it's traveling 1, so it will be at the boundary again. Okay. Then let's take the displacement gradient. So h is the derivative of u with respect to the reference configuration. So let's boil this down. What we have to do here is derive the vector function with respect to x1. And here we have it with x1. And then the vector function with respect to x2. Okay, let's see, that's fairly simple. u1 with respect to x1 is a one, then u2 with x1 is say zero, and u1 with respect to x2, there is no x2, so we have zero, and here we also have zero, and that's our displacement gradient. Okay, let us look at another example. And for this, I have a more complicated or more abstract displacement, and this displacement is this time also a transient displacement, so it's time dependent, and it is given as three x three squared t minus x two x one, and we have an x one to the power of four, and we have five x one squared x three squared. Okay, displacement gradient h is the derivative of u with respect to the reference configuration. So we derive u1 with respect to x1, then u2 with respect to x1, then u3 with respect to x1, then u1 with respect to x2, then u2 with respect to x2, then u3 with respect to x2, and I think you get the pattern. I will just finish it for completion. And here we go. That's what we have to do. Find our nine derivatives. Then let's plug it in. u1 with respect to x1. This, of course, results in minus x2. Then u2 with respect to x1 will be 4x1 to the power of 3. u1 with u3 with respect to x1 will be, oh sorry, I wanted a square here, but that does not matter yet. So um, with respect to x1 will be a 10 x1 x3 squared. And here u1 with respect to x2 will be, um, oh, this is, why are we getting uh, minus two? It should be, of course, only be minus x2. Okay, not minus two x2. Well, then here we have minus x1, obviously. And then u2 with respect to x2, there is no x2, so it is a zero. And u3 with respect to x2, there is no x2 here. Then u1 with respect to x3, where we will get 6x3t. And then the next, this one with respect to x3 will be zero. And here we uh, derive respect to x3, and there we needed a square, so that it matches my reference solution, and it is 10x1 squared x3. Okay, some remarks on the displacement gradient. 
and we see contrary to what we had up here or what you could have guessed but which is not gen true in general that we have a non-symmetric matrix or general um, or generally H is not symmetric and secondly this is what is visible here that H is still a function of the reference configuration and t of course and by function of course it will be an a tensor function so it maps an like three-dimensional space input and time input to a tensor and that makes sense since it's associating an mode of shape change let's say bending elongation whatever to a particular point within our potato and since every point in a potato can be deformed or displaced differently throughout the time also of our displacement this is a valid description or it's like a valid fact that this will stay a function of x and t in the general case surely if it does not vanish 